From the Toronto Star, I'm Rajiv Mudder, and this matters. We see the light at the end of the tunnel. We are hopeful. We are getting there because our scientists are working incredibly hard. This week started off with the first piece of universally hailed good COVID-19 news since, well, ever. Pfizer announced that it is in late stage testing of its COVID-19 vaccine, which shows signs of being 90% effective. And while that serves as a great piece of hope, it was also just an announcement with very little actual data behind it, at least right now. Even if it pans out, there will be logistical hurdles in distributing it and many more factors before we get to the end of this tunnel. Alex Boyd is a reporter in the Star's Calgary Bureau. She's been on our road to a vaccine beat for months. She returns to this matters to discuss the piece of vaccine development news that has us all talking. Alex, thank you so much for joining us again. Thanks for having me. Okay, so Pfizer broke the internet on Monday saying they potentially have a vaccine that is 90% effective. I think everybody has sort of binged as much info as we can because we all want this. But Alex, let's start off. Tell us a little bit about this vaccine and what's next? How will this get into our hands? So you're right. Monday was, I think, a very, very exciting day for those of us who've been following the race for a vaccine. And obviously, we're still in a global pandemic, so that's that's a lot of us. And it was the first peak of results from the final stage of human testing for the vaccine that's been underway for months by Pfizer, obviously one of the biggest pharmaceutical companies in the world, and a German startup called BioNTech. They've tested on over 40,000 people. They've tested across seven different countries. And so this was kind of the first look at the results. And, and like you say, it's suggested it could be as much as 90% effective at preventing COVID-19. There are obviously caveats important to keep in mind. They haven't finished testing. That has to continue. These numbers will have to face the scrutiny of the larger scientific community. But I think it's, it's important to realize that what these results really represent is that We've seen teams racing for months. They've all been trying to create what would be a brand new vaccine. But this is really the first major sign we've seen that this is possible. A vaccine will eventually be developed. We're not there yet. There are many steps to come. But as one expert I talked to this week, this has really shifted her from kind of theoretical optimism to actual optimism. And like you say, you know, there's lots of steps to be done. They need to finish their testing. They anticipate that will take them sometime around the third week of November to get all the numbers that they they need. At that point, that data goes to Health Canada. I think it's important to remember that we have our own regulatory system here in the country. So the scientists there need to go through all this information. At that point, they either you know, have questions, want more information, or they decide whether or not they want to approve it. And then at that point, you know, manufacturing and distribution, those are going to be huge issues as well that we're going to need to deal with. But no question about it, Monday was really good news. Now, the other thing is, this is one of the vaccines that the government of Canada has purchased millions of doses of, right? It is, correct. So what exactly does that mean? Because obviously, uh, it's probably a bit of a seller's market right now. <laughs> and the other <laughs> thing is, is, who here would get it first? Definitely. Yeah. So Canada has been working on this issue for months. And so they've actually locked down contracts with seven different vaccine candidates. And it is a little bit like gambling. All of these vaccine candidates are still in development. We don't know that any of them are going to work. So worst case scenario, we lose a little bit of money if these, these candidates don't develop. But if they pass testing, if they pass regulation, then what that contract says is we are entitled to a certain number of doses. So we've got a spot in line. So when we talk about Pfizer, for example, we're already entitled to 20 million doses. And it's important to remember that everyone's going to need two doses. So we're talking roughly 10 million people here. And I think as you can probably tell from those numbers, the assumption is that when a vaccine becomes available, there's not going to be enough to go around, at least at first. And so last week, what we saw is the National Advisory Commission on Immunization, which is a national council that gives us advice on all sorts of immunization matters within our borders. They came out with a list of priorities of people who they say should get the vaccine first. And so if we want to minimize illness, minimize deaths, minimize societal disruption, that was kind of the goal they set themselves. Their recommendations are that the first people to be immunized should be seniors, frontline workers, 
people who are high risk and those who have connections to high risk situations like long term care homes. So this isn't set in stone, you know, the provinces, and the territories will do the actual vaccination. So ultimately, it will be their decision. But this is kind of what the experts that we have for this purpose are telling us. What are the issues with potentially distributing this vaccine? I mean, I read one of the things is that it has to be kept incredibly cold. Yes. So, I mean, distributing any vaccine was always going to be a logistical problem, but this one is an extra level of difficult, I think. It's what's called an RNA vaccine. So it uses a brand new technology. People are very excited about it. But the downside is that these vaccines at this point have to be stored at a very, very cold temperature. We're talking minus 70, minus 80, very, very cold. And so we might fix this problem in later generations of the vaccine, but at the moment, it is what it is. And so the government is actually looking right now for a company to do this distribution for them. And they're talking about packing them in dry ice, switching the dry ice out as they go. So the cold chain issue, as they call it, is going to be a real big issue. And that's on top of you know, having to get vaccines across the country. And this company is going to have to be highly flexible in the sense that they don't know which vaccines are going to be coming in. We don't know yet where they're coming from. The stipulation the government has laid out is that if a province or a territory needs vaccines right now, they need to be able to get a shipment to them within 48 hours. So whoever gets this job, it's going to be a tall order. I want actual optimism as much as anybody else. And I don't want to rain on anybody's parade, but this is what's being called science by press release. Explain what that term means. Every scientist's favorite phrase, but what that means, I guess to back up a step. So in less urgent times, if you had a big development you wanted the world to know about, what you would do is you would do your study, you would gather your numbers, you would write a paper, you would submit it to a journal, and then it would go through what's called peer review. So a bunch of experts in your field would come in and they would read your paper and they would look at your numbers and they would ask questions and they would make sure that the science stood up. But what we're seeing with COVID is that COVID research is happening really, really fast. People around the world are working on this. They've got tons of money. So things are just progressing really, really quickly. And that's a good thing. I think we all want this to happen really quickly. But what we're seeing more of is when a company like Pfizer has big news, like they did on Monday, instead of waiting to go through the paper process, they just put out a press release. And that's what we saw early Monday. They just splashed this online. It was very quickly making headlines around the world. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. I think we all wanted to know this. And to be clear, I don't think anyone is saying Pfizer made this up. Like they know the eyes of the world are on them. But that process of peer review and making sure other scientists can see these numbers is just a really critical part of the scientific process. And so this process will happen. Pfizer says they're going to go ahead with this. But I think it's just important to remember that it hasn't gone through that vetting yet. And so that will be something for for people to keep an eye on. One of the striking things about this is that it could be 90% effective. And I think one of the things that I read that they were looking for one that was 50% effective. Can you explain a little bit about the math there for us? Yes. So yeah, the globally kind of accepted standard that most vaccines have been aiming for is 50%. And so there's not a specific formula for that, but some of the things that they were considering was the fact that they're aware those first vaccines are not going to be perfect. And so I think there was an acceptance that maybe something's not as effective as it could be, but at this point, something is better than nothing. But at the same time, you want it to be effective enough that you would actually see some impact on the spread of the disease if enough people took this vaccine. So I think that's how they arrived at that 50% number. That said, you know, if Pfizer is looking at 90%, they've obviously blown that standard out of the water. We'll be right back. I think one of the striking things is that it's 90% effective when I believe that experts were looking for one that was 50% effective. Can you explain those numbers to us a little bit? Yeah, it's interesting. It's actually fairly basic math. Obviously, clinical trials are complicated things, but the central premise is relatively basic. So if I'm running a trial, I bring in a whole bunch of people, I give half of them my vaccine candidate, 
and then I give half of them the placebo. And then I just send them back out, let them go back to their lives and see how many get COVID. When I have a certain number that have COVID, in the results that we saw on Monday, the magic number was 94 cases of COVID. They would then compare the number of people that were in the placebo group and the number of people that were in the vaccinated group. And so what they found was that the vast majority of those numbers were in the placebo group, which implies that the vaccinated group is fair better, you can then deduce from the vaccine. And so they're hoping to get 146 cases of COVID. That's the number that they've decided using statistics is kind of the number that they need. At that point, they will have, have all the numbers that they need to make a conclusion. Alex, one of the things you said last time was we're probably going to have a few vaccines. So I want to know how this perhaps maybe affect the other candidates and also What about the other candidates? Do we know where they are? And are there any other promising signs that we should be aware of? Because one of the things with this one too, I believe this is also going to have to be an annual dosage, right? We're not sure yet. (laughs) That's the other big question I think people need to, to keep in mind is that what scientists call durability at this point is a giant question mark. So we know people are getting immunity, but how long will it last? Is it for life? Is it for a year? Is it for five years? We literally have no idea. It's actually kind of a not knowable question right now, given how recently this testing has been done. So it's the sort of thing where we're just going to have to kind of follow along and see. But that's obviously going to be a big part of this. It's also a reason why, like you say, experts really want other vaccine developers to keep doing the work that they're doing. We can't just say, oh, great, the Pfizer vaccine is done. Let's all just go home for the day. There is still an advantage to having multiple vaccines at the end of this. As we've already talked about, you know, the Pfizer vaccine is going to be real hard to distribute. It's a two-dose regimen. Not all of them, though most of them are going to look like that. But if we end up with multiple vaccines at the end of the day, maybe some of them are easier to distribute. Maybe some of them have an easier shelf life. Maybe some of them are better at seniors. We just don't know all of those elements yet. So the hope is that at the end of this, we still end up with a range of vaccines that we can use in, in different situations. And on that note, as mentioned, you know, we have agreements with seven different companies. We know that four others are in stage three, so in that final stage of testing, though obviously we learned Monday that Pfizer's in the lead at this point. And then also kind of another interesting Made in Canada news, Metacago, this is the one Made in Canada vaccine. They're based in Quebec. They announced their stage one results earlier this week. So they're going to be moving into stage two. So they're not quite as far along as, as some of the leaders here, but we do have a made in Canada dose in the race as well. Governments have sped up approvals due to COVID-19. What has the Canadian government done in that regard? Right. So what we've done is last month, the minister signed what's called a ministerial order, which is basically just a blanket document that's meant to, to grow wheels on all things COVID. So it's meant to speed up importation of products related to COVID, speed up approvals, give government scientists a little bit more flexibility in terms of how they approve things. So it's meant to just kind of make all of our processes go a little bit faster. One of the big ones is they're allowing companies to do what's called a rolling submission. So normally Pfizer would have to do all their testing. When they finished, they would take all their documents over to Health Canada and their scientists would go through the information and decide whether or not to approve or not. Instead, what they're doing is they're just giving them updates as they go. It's kind of like having a government scientist look over your shoulder as you work. And the hope is that that will speed up an eventual approval if that's the direction that they decide to go. But I think the reason why people are asking this question, we're hearing a lot about emergency authorizations in the states. That's kind of the tool that the Americans have used to get things on the markets a little bit faster. And that's just not something we normally see in Canada. I know some people are calling for it. That's probably a question for other people. But here in Canada, it really all comes back to that ministerial order. Okay. Can we talk about some like timelines of this? November, I mean, there's some people talking about maybe... As early as April, there could be something. What are you thinking? What are you hearing from the experts about that? So the timeline, to start with kind of government officials here, obviously this is their task. The timeline that we've heard from them pretty consistently is early 2021. And the prime minister reiterated that earlier this week in his remarks 
after the Pfizer news. He said, you know, early next year is kind of when they're hoping that a vaccine could land. We also know that the government is looking for that company, as I mentioned, right now to begin distribution, and they want them ready to go as early as January. Will we have a vaccine by then? Not sure, but at least they'll have someone who's there ready to take that box if one begins arriving at that point. So early 2021 is probably the absolute earliest we could see that in Canada. But again, it's important to remember that, you know, not everyone is going to get that first dose when they begin arriving. It is most likely that we're going to see frontline workers, seniors get those first doses in order to protect some people that are most vulnerable in our society. So if you're younger, if you're healthier, that's probably going to push it again, best case scenario into next summer, next fall. Obviously, rolling this thing out is probably going to take a year's time at least, right? At least. The government is looking to contract a company into the first little bit of 2022. And that's honestly probably a minimum. We know that countries around the world are going to be looking for these vaccines. It's gotten a little competitive. That's obviously something people have been critical of strategies like Canada's where we've tried to lock down vaccines for ourselves. But the whole world really is going to be looking for these vaccines. So, you know, this is not going to be a process that happens overnight. What are you following right now? What's next about this story that you want to to lock down and report on? I really want to see the results of the study that comes out. I'd like to see all the results. I'd like to see what the other experts have to say about it, because I think that is just such an important part of the process. I think the other thing to watch, too, is that, you know, obviously here in Canada, the provinces are going to have a lot of say in terms of how that final step of distribution is done, who actually gets the vaccine. So there's some potential here for them to maybe you know, adopt different strategies or look at this in different ways. And so, you know, it's the federal government's job to get vaccines, to get doses to the provinces and territories. But from there, you know, there is a lot of leeway for them to to make their own decisions. And so I think, you know, something to watch is going to be as we start to see the provinces announce some of their own news, how are they approaching this problem? I think that's going to be a big part of it. The other thing too, I think that's important to remember even, or, or that I think will be something to watch is, you know, as we heard the prime minister say earlier this week, if you get COVID this week, if you get COVID next week, a vaccine is not going to do you a whole lot of good. And so I think it's it's also really important for people to remember that we need to keep social distancing. We need to, you know, continue listening to public health experts because a vaccine, you know, isn't coming tomorrow. Remember to wear a mask if you're outside as well. Obviously, we have to keep on mitigating these things. You know, Alex, one of the things that I'm, I'm super curious about is, and this is a bit of a silly question, because obviously what we had, I believe, was an Operation Warp Speed, Project Light Speed, which I believe the Pfizer vaccine was not a part of or funded for. But does this thing have a cool name yet? Is it just the Pfizer vaccine? (laughs) Uh, No, no. Uh, Operation Warp Speed is America's whole plan to develop a vaccine and get it out there very quickly. And I mean, you can't beat them for branding. We don't have a name like that, which is too bad. All the vaccines kind of have like little number and letter codes, I think, just so that they're labeled, because some of these companies have multiple vaccine candidates, right? So it's like, I can't remember off the top of my head what the Pfizer one is, but they're very boring little codes. So are we going to name them? I don't know. Is there a branding opportunity here? Maybe, but uh, sadly, no, there's not a name for it yet. Alex, there is always a branding opportunity, (laughs) particularly when we're saving lives. This has been fantastic for us. I really want to thank you for your time. But is there anything that I didn't ask that you think our listeners should know and keep in mind about this? I think, again, you know, the vaccine is coming. It's positive news. I think a lot of experts are legitimately excited about what's coming, but there are just a lot of steps between now and you getting to roll up your sleeves. So, you know, those public health initiatives are going to be important and just be patient. You know, this stuff takes time. We have a regulatory process in this country for a reason. It's just going to take a little bit of time for them to do the jobs they need to do. That's great advice. Once again, I really want to thank you for your time today. Thanks, guys. Alex Boyd is a reporter for the Stars Calgary Bureau. She's been covering our Road to the Vaccine series. That's it for today. Thanks so much for joining us. This Matters is hosted and produced by me, Raju Mudler, Adrian Chung, and Saba Etizaz. Produced and mixed by Sean Pattenden, and our director of programming is J.P. Foso. Our show theme music is by So Called, and our episode music is by Mike DeAngelis. We want to hear what stories matter to you. Please send us comments, questions, or ideas to thismatters at thestar.ca. 
please consider supporting the journalism the Toronto Star Newsroom does at thestar.com. And don't forget to subscribe to This Matters on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Let's talk soon. Thank you.